Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Luis Maya, and here we are again with our class, The Behavioral Economics of Global Affairs. Today, we're going to talk about cognitive biases. We have already started talking about those on our last class, in our last class. But today, we're also going to talk a little bit about how these this researchers, some of them psychologists, most of them psychologists, how they came up with this cognitive biases, uh, in, through which procedures they could uh, establish those as scientific facts. Essentially, we're going to talk about experiments, okay? So we're going to have kind of a, a very brief discussion about experimental economics, all right? Okay, so here we go. The first thing to notice is that there are different kind, kinds of, of experiments, right? We have the so-called lab experiments. So here, individuals are stimulated or asked to perform relatively simple tests with clearly observable evidences of their choices and behaviors. Oh, wait, wait, wait. We're talking about here, experiments with people, right? So we have to be a little bit careful about um, ethical questions. We have to get their uh, acknowledgement. They have to agree to participate freely. So there are some, um, some issues there and we have to be very careful before we starting, we just start uh, submitting people to some sort of experiment, okay? They have the right to be informed and to participate voluntarily, freely, okay? But then again, uh, what we try to do there is to look for or uh, monitor a limited number of variables and establish kind of a controlled environment, a context uh, over which we have relative control. Uh, we have to be careful in order to set the so-called control groups. Uh, here, the idea is just like when we are developing a new vaccine, uh, some people take the shot and they are just receiving placebo, right? Something that is not going to be actively protecting that, those people against any sort of disease. We call that control group, the placebo effect. And we also have the treatment. Some people who will actually take the shot and they will receive some sort of vaccine. The same sort of stuff we have to do when we perform experiments in behavior economics. We have to uh, submit some people to some sort of intervention and compare that, compare their behavior, their choices, with those which did not participate in any sort of intervention, okay? So we can compare the two uh, uh, decisions or set of decisions, right? Uh, there's some risks. Uh, when we perform experiments with people, uh, we have to be very careful because uh, sometimes people will not take those experiments seriously, right? Uh, we have to try and replicate uh, usual everyday life situations so that people will, as most as possible, behave just like they would if they were just living their own lives, okay? Uh, we have also to be extremely careful about creating any sort of discomfort or, I don't know, we have to be careful to not harm people in any way whenever they participate freely, voluntarily, and uh, previously informed of, a, of an experiment, okay? Uh, here, there is an example. We have the framing experiment of Levin and Gap. Basically, what they did there was to realize how would people react to the label in this kind of meat package, right? When you go to the supermarket, you wanna purchase meat, 
In this case here, people were buying ground beef, carne moída. So we have like two different packs of ground meat, dois pacotinhos, cada um com uma quantidade de carne moída. And then you have different labels, adesivos, yeah, in each of them. In one case, we say, this is a 75% fat-free product. So we are saying that 75% of the meat there is absolutely free of uh, fat. And then we are presenting the same information, but in a slightly different way. We say, okay, this is the same product, but now we are telling you that it's 25% fat, all right? So you're kind of giving the same information to people, but in different frames, you know? Frames, when you're trying to set, uh, you know, highlighting some specific aspects of a painter or I don't know, of a picture. So framing is how we pose some issues, how we present some issues. And we, we will be noticing as we move along this class, that people are very susceptible to different frames. In other ways, in other words, the way you present a choice will affect people's uh, choices. You know, the way you present the options will affect people's choices. All right. So those are lab experiments. They are very useful in behavior economics, but sometimes we have to go for and look for different sort of experiments. Let's talk about those. We also have field experiments. So a field experiment applies the scientific method to experimentally examine an intervention in the real world rather than in laboratory, right? In this case, the number of variables that can impact or somehow influence people's choices is large. They can complicate the interpretation of results. Ethical concerns in this case are even more critical because sometimes you will have to make those experiments with large number of members of a community, for example. So we have to be even more careful about the ethical ethical procedures beforehand, okay? To make sure no one's gonna be harmed and everyone that participates will also, will also participate in a freely uh, informed, voluntarily way, okay? So uh, as before, we have an example here. Hussein and List, they actually studied financial incentives for weak production of Chinese workers. So here we have a Chinese factory and we gather people and say, all right, here's the new deal. You guys will get like a 200 reais check, $200 check. And uh, as long as you guys keep doing the good work, we are gonna give you one of, this, one of these checks every month, all right? Yeah, great, yeah, yeah, it's like, uh, we, we, we got a, uh, a better wage, a better pay now or something like this. But notice, we are telling people, as long as you keep working very productively, you're gonna get this money. But if the target, the production target is not met, if we don't reach our goals, then we're gonna take away that money, okay? That extra pay. This is one deal. And the other deal was to say, look guys, we will only give you a $200 check if you meet a certain goal. And then they realize which of these schemes is more effective, all right? And they realize that financial gains for outstanding performance were more effective than starting from a default gain and scaring people out with possible reductions if low performance took place. All right, so different sort of incentives, and then you see which of those is more effective, all right? 
once again, there are ethical issues here. You have to have free participation from individuals, okay? And we know that, unfortunately, in China, uh, volunteer participation, democracy, it's not a, a very uncontroversial issue, okay? All right. The last one is what we call natural experience. In natural experience, what we do is to observe real life and try to look for moments or events that end up being a sort of experiment. So if something happens in a community and it affects only part of that community, I can eventually come and say, let me check if this event um, had the, a specific impact because now I have a control group. I have some people who did not suffer the same sort of, of or not, did not uh, went through the same experience or something like that, all right? So it's a careful observation of real world phenomena where individuals are naturally exposed to special circumstances and behaviors become reasonably evident. We don't have control over treatment and control groups, but we have to be very careful to investigate them. And we're gonna try to make statistical inference, which means uh, based on samples, we are gonna try to make statements about the whole population, right? All right, so in this example here, Johnson and some colleagues studied auto insurance. So what happened is that law changes in two states of the US, neighbor states, New Jersey and Pennsylvania, they are right next to each other. What happened is that the premium you have to pay to get auto insurance, the amount you have to pay so that your car is safe, uh, that amount changed after a certain new rules came up. All right, so what was this change? The change was this. In one case, as you were filling out your policy, you know, your proposal for your car insurance, then in one case, if you check a box, that means you agree to not litigate. In other words, not take the company, the insurance company into court if something and something happens. Now, in the other case, if you check the box, you're saying that uh, you are not declaring that you will not litigate. So, I mean, it's just checking a box, but in one case, if you do nothing, you agree with a new rule. And if you, in the second case, if you check the box, you agree with the different rule, right? So basically it's like, what is the default option? What is the choice if I do nothing, all right? And they realize that just by changing this small detail in a form, lots and lots of people decided to participate in this kind of agreement uh, to not litigate and therefore to not create additional expenses to the insurance companies in such and such and such cases, right? What it turns out that if fewer people litigate, if fewer people sue the insurance company, then what would happen is that the amount of money that the insurance company would have to charge people so that they can guarantee safety of their property, it's smaller. And the question was, will companies charge less if these things happen? And what they did, they realized that yes, companies did charge less when they uh, we're dealing with a less risky environment in terms of the insurance company, okay? So this is also an interesting event because this was not planned, right? This was just something that happened in two states and then 
naturally this event occurred, but the researcher said, wait, wait, I can check that as if it was an experiment, all right? All right, so these sort of procedures, either one of those experiments, they are the fundamental of a number of economic, behavior economics researches, all right? Uh, we end up having, uh, as, as behavior economics proceeds, we end up having like a list of behavioral economics principles. Those are mostly heuristics, regrinhas de bolso, and biases, vieses, or tendências cognitivas. We're going to talk a lot about those throughout this week, okay? In any case, the point to remember is that every single bias that I described to you over the next few minutes, all of them were the results of scientific research, which means they came up from experiments, very careful experiments with people, so that they were actually empirically fundamented or, I'm, I don't know, proved, all right? Tested, it would be better, all right. So when we talk about uh, cognitive biases, well, the most fascinating figure, in my opinion, is the one you guys have right in front of you. What you see there is like a codex, um código, uma coletânea, um manual de vieses cognitivos. A Wikipedia, the encyclopedia, the online encyclopedia, gather all of these uh, cognitive biases in a list. And here, what you have is sort of a diagram showing you all of this cognitive bias in one single image. Okay, what is the point here? Each and every one of this set of words here is naming a specific cognitive biases. And we have like four big areas, four big chunks of cognitive bias to talk about. The first one here are those things that happen when people face too much information before making a decision. Now, this area here, all those things happen when people have not enough meaning. They may even have information, but they don't have uh, what they, they could count as meaningful information, right? Now, the third area here, when people need to act fast. You guys know if you have to make a decision fast, there is a good chance you're gonna make a mistake. Okay, so these guys collected, gather all sort of effects that are observable when people have to make choices really fast. And finally, you have what people have to what happens when people have to look for some sort of memory before making a decision? When you have to remember something before making a choice, well, it turns out that there are some uh, possible uh, biases that will affect your decision. Uh, como se houvessem deslizes previsíveis quando para tomar uma decisão uma pessoa precisar se recorrer à sua memória, all right? So, too much information, not enough meaning, when you need to act fast, and finally, when you have to remember something before making a choice, before making a decision, all right? Uh, you can look closer here. You're gonna see that you're gonna have like something like anchoring. We're gonna talk about that later conservatism, framing effect, we have mentioned it already, confirmation bias, this is a very important one, we're going to talk about that in just a little bit, and you keep going. Here in the lower part, you have bandwagon effect, we're going to talk about that in a few minutes, 
hallow effect. Hallow here is como, uh, it's like efeito auréola. Hallow here means auréola, efeito auréola. Que diabo será isso? Well, it turns out that uh, if the person uh, offering you some sort of deal is very good looking, is like a good look lady or a good looking guy, just by being handsome or beautiful girl, uh, you're going to be like willing to accept the offer. So some people, just because they're of their looks, they can get away with lots of deals. So there is this halo effect, which means effect aureola, like you think that is a good person just because it is a beautiful person or something like this, all right? physically attractive. Uh, then we have, to, when you have to act fast, there are so many examples here. We're gonna talk about some of them. And memories. By the way, guys, look, please try and remember that uh, our memory, it's not like a very truthworthy, very uh, likely, uh, very trustworthy, a register of the past. Sometimes we kind of uh, doramos a pirula na hora de fazer nossas memórias. We have like a romantic view of our past uh, events. So our memory, it's not so objective, so precise as we would like to think they are, all right? So we have to uh, be careful with that. We're going to talk a little bit about memories later on, too, and how they can affect our choices. Okay, so let's start and selecting some of those cognitive biases that will be especially of our interest, especially interesting for us. The first of all is ambiguity effect, efeito ambiguidade, the tendency to avoid options for which Missing information makes the probability seem unknown. All right, so what we are talking here, if we someone offered us some sort of choice and we cannot compare very well the options, well, we try to not make those choices. We will avoid having to make those choices. And if we do, sometimes we will pick one and not even think about it. So we, when we want to create better choice or to manage uh, and help people making better choice, we have to try to eliminate all sort of ambiguity, okay? Ambiguidade é uma coisa que atrapalha boas escolhas. We're gonna talk a little bit later of examples of those. The second one, attentional bias. Now, this is something very important nowadays, people. Check this out. The tendency of our perception to be affected by, by our recurring thoughts. So here's the thing. If we only think bad stuff, if we only focus on problems, on stressful situations, on risks, crises, and things like that, it turns out that our ability to perceive reality gets affected by that. So the, if we have recurring thoughts about sickness, we may end up getting sick, actually. So this is a very powerful and important thing here. Our brain tends to perceive reality in a way that it is affected by what we think most often, right? We're gonna give an example of that in a little bit. And then we have the bandwagon effect. This is kind of trivial and pretty much well known. É o chamado efeito manada. You know, people tend to believe or to do stuff just because many other people do. All right, so efeito manada. Se está todo mundo fazendo uma coisa, a gente também vai lá 
e acaba fazendo daquela mesma forma. But the question that we must pose is, is it a big deal? Those examples that I gave you, how important are they are in our everyday life? So think, for example, about political debates and polarization. Uh, these things have invaded all sorts of discussions. Uh, initially, we had like, oh, if you are talking about economic policy, you can be right and I will be left, and then we are going to disagree. But now people from right and left, they disagree about the color of our flag. They disagree about how fast a car should be uh, authorized to run on the streets. They disagree about uh, drugs, which drugs should be taken if you are sick with this or that. So what we see is that people are too much in cluster or closed in small groups and they try to think together. So this sort of bandwagon effect, efeito manada, is, is polarizing people in all sorts of discussion. If you are from the group of Bolsonaro, then you're going to behave and you're going to say something like this. If you are in the group of left wing parties, then you're going to do things like this and like that. So um, sometimes people don't stop and think by themselves. They just follow the other people. Okay, so this is a big problem. Polarization has reached unprecedented levels here in Brazil. The second one is ambiguity effect. Now, remember, uh, one year ago, people were astonished by COVID-19. We were all worried about the pandemic. But then some people said, yeah, everybody should wear masks. And then some other scientists and authorities came up on TV and said, no, 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 nobody should wear masks, just doctors and nurses. And then later on, people came back and said, no, 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 we are wrong. Uh, yeah, you should wear masks. What's going on? You know, even today, people are not sure if they should wear a mask, a mask all the time or not. Uh, what kind of benefit they have they have from wearing masks and what kind of harms the excessive use of masks can cause. So this became a controversial issue. There is ambiguity. There is not certainty about the use of masks. And then we have all sort of controversies. We have skepticism. We have people doubtful of which procedure to take, how they should behave, and there's a lot of confusion about that. We should avoid, we should have avoid that sort of ambiguity right from the start. And finally, okay, we are in a pandemic, everybody is taking classes in their own houses, we cannot leave, we can't go to a bar and meet some friends, so many of us stay at home, turn on the TV, and they keep getting this endless amount of bad news. Yeah, we have some problems here. Yeah, we have global warming. Yeah, we have pandemics. Yeah, the hospitals are full. It's all bad news, bad news, and bad news every day for hours. If you do something like that, Look at this guy here on my right hand side of the, the picture. This guy is like suffering. So mental health is at risk at this point. We have to be careful. We have to take care of the general environment inside our brain. We should not expose ourselves too much for too long for bad news, or, or I mean, by bad news, we, we have to kind of have like an equilibrium and try to avoid excessive exposure 
to bad news, otherwise we may end up getting sick, mentally ill, all right? Okay, let's have three more of those cognitive bias and then we try and see some examples. First one is bias blind spot. Blind spot, ponto cego, is something that you yourself sometimes cannot perceive. All right, so the bias blind spot is the tendency to see oneself, ourselves, as less biased than other people or to be able to identify more cognitive biases in others than in oneself. All right, it's not because you are taking this class. It's everybody all the time, all right? We ourselves, we think that we are good. Our brain is very perceptful and is very smart to identify the issues, the problems, the mistakes that other people make. But sometimes we cannot see, we cannot look at ourselves from a good perspective, right? So we tend to think that our brain, our reasoning is good and someone else is making a mistake, all right? This is a, a trend, this is a tendency. You can see that with Chinese people, Portuguese people, Brazilian people, American people, whoever, all right? All over the world, we are talking here about human brain features, the characteristics of human reasoning. It's not specific to one culture or to one society um, separately. Okay, the second one, one is choice supportive bias. This is kind of funny too. The tendency to remembers one, remember one's choices as better than they actually were. So when we make choices, we try to defend it. We say, no, that was a very good choice. So let's suppose that I take you to a restaurant and then I say, yeah, you should have this sort of pizza. This is the best pizza you're gonna have. Please go ahead, pick this one, you're gonna love it. And then, even if my friend just tells me, that, yeah, I didn't like that. I, I, I should have stick with some other choice. Even if someone tells me that that was not a good choice, I will still be holding up to this thing saying, you know, I gave you the best choice. You should have, you should have liked it. It doesn't matter if, you know, if, if we gave some people a bad advice, we still think that our options are good we have some sort of difficulty to be self-critic about our previous choices, right? And the third one, this is a big deal. The third one is called confirmation bias. Check this out, guys. This is a very important one. The tendency to search for, interpret, focus on, and only remember information in a way that confirm my perception. So I have this preconceito and I say, yeah, yeah, I know what's going on. So when I look at some sort of phenomenon, it turns out that I already jumped to the conclusion. I have the conclusion already. And even sometimes when the evident, evidence is clearly against my conclusion, Sometimes I will force it a way to, to argue that, yeah, that was the correct interpretation. So the way we interpret things sometimes are deeply um, connected to our prejudice, to our previous conception about that. It's very hard to look at some phenomenon, to observe some events, and to have this absolutely fresh look at stuff so that we are free to make any conclusions that the observation may uh, indicate, all right? Uh, but then again, when, when do we see that? What is the point with these three biases? The first one, isn't it easy to see when your boss or your teacher 
or your father, your mother, when they make a mistake. When other people make a mistake, for us, it's like immediately evident. And we don't have the same clarity, the same, the same clearance, the same clarity when we look at ourselves. When we make mistakes, it's hard for us to perceive, all right? So that's like a lesson that we all should have. I think there is even some, some mention of this sort of wisdom in the Bible. But then again, those of you who are more religious may remember something like that. Something like, uh, é, tire primeiro uma trave que está no seu olho antes de você apontar um cisco no olho do seu colega, alguma coisa assim. All right, so this is something we all have to be careful and we have to be humble. You know, humility, we have to be modest and eventually uh, be careful not to jump to conclusions and to judge people too fast. Uh, the second one here, uh, the confirmation bias, check this out. There are many people out there who think that they can take ivermectina and they are going to get protected from coronavirus even though there is no scientific proof of that. But some people say, you know what? I took Ivermectina and I never had COVID-19. So it works. But that, there is no causation here, uh, or at least no proven causation between the two uh, events. The fact that I took Ivermectina may have nothing to do to my uh, health. I, I may just not have been exposed to the virus, right? To the virus. So sometimes we look at stuff and no matter how many times reality tells us, yes, 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 we still find a way to connect the dots and say, yeah, here it is. The, the answer clearly is no. And what reality is telling me is yes, 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 yes. All right. So you guys understand that, right? Now, the next one, when we, if we pick this class, I, I want to take Luis Maya's classes. Or if, we, if you choose a car, yeah, I'm going to drive this, I don't know, Nissan. Yeah, I'm going to drive this Renault car. If you pick the health insurance, Whenever we make a choice, we tend to stick with it. We say, you know, that's the, the, what, that was the right choice. I love the option that I made. And sometimes we take too long to realize that our choices need revision. And it happens many times. Every one of us, we are humans, right? We make mistakes. But as humans, we also tend to insist in many mistakes. This is something that is kind of uh, programmed in our brain, and we have to be, uh, we have to pay attention to that. Otherwise, we may, uh, you know, keep making mistakes for a long, long time. Okay, let's have these three more uh, examples here, and then we're going to stop. We're going to leave something for our next time together. All right? So, this one here is telling the first one conservatism. Be careful, we're not here talking about conservadorismo in general. We are here talking about conservatism, the tendency to revise one's belief insufficiently when presented with new evidence. So it, it's similar, but not the same thing as choice supportive bias. So here is a, like a more general phenomenon. So uh, opinions, uh, preferences, we, we don't want to change all the time. So if you ask me, Luis, what's your favorite color? And I would say, yeah, it's green. And you say, for how long? For how long green is your favorite color? And I would tell you, my whole life. It's been like that. So I, maybe, maybe I never gave a chance to brown or to red. I never really... Uh, investigated how much I like yellow. I just say, yeah, it's green. That's my favorite color. And that's it. 
And many times we behave like that for important choices in our lives. We have to pay attention to this. It's a tendency. It's uma tendência. We don't want to revise our beliefs and our preferences uh, all the time. The second one, it's very interesting one too, is the so-called Dunning-Kruger effect. Dunning-Kruger effect, uh, it, it, it has a huge impact in the, way we, in the way we hire services. If you hire a lawyer, if you hire an accountant, if you hire a mechanic, uh, sometimes people who are not so skilled, you know, they don't have too much ability, but they think that they are the best. And sometimes you have people who have studied some sort of question or some sort of technique for a very, very, very long time. And if you ask them, are you an expert? Are you a specialist in this? They say, no, I still have lots to learn. You see, sometimes people have just read one book about a subject and they think that they are an authority about that issue. And some other people spend their whole lives studying one specific technique or procedure or context. And if you ask them, do you know it all? And they say, no, no way. I'm just beginning to understand what's going on here. So what happens? It turns out that people are way too confident in their knowledge and ability, their, comp their level of competence, if they start learning about a subject. And once they go deeper and deeper, they realize the point here is that we are not so good at measuring the size of our own ignorance. If we are ignorant, sometimes we're not even uh, we are not even able to realize our ignorance. All right. We're going to talk a little bit more about those Dunning Kruger effect, okay? And when they come up, uh, the endowment effect. Well, this is kind of interesting too, and you have impacts of this bias right on the way people make their investments. So what is endowment effect? The tendency for people to demand much more money to give up something than they would be willing to pay to acquire it. So it's like you purchase a car and you spend like 35,000 reais. But if someone the next week asks you to sell you the car, you say, no, this is worth more. I, I paid 30,000, but this is clearly worth like 35 or 36,000. So when things are ours, we value them very generously and way more generously than when we purchase something from someone else. So, the, the classical example for this is when people invest in stocks. If you buy a share of Petrobras, Vale do Rio Doce, and things like that. So let's suppose you purchase the shares of Petrobras at 28 reais each. And then the price goes down and it's worth now 25 reais. People don't sell those stocks because they think, you know what, they are worth at least 28. And they don't realize that the market doesn't work like this. If it was 25 this morning, it may become 22 in the afternoon. It may become 30, yeah, but it can also go down to 18. So people uh, tend to um, hold on to what they think some of their property is valued, right? If they think that something you, you own is valued as such and such, you're not going to revise that evaluation very frequently. You're going to try to stick with your, with your opinion about how much worth it is that property, okay? Let me go back a little bit before I finish this recorded session. Let me go back a little bit to this Dunning-Kruger effect, okay? What we have here, 
we have here a diagram. In this axis, you have the level of confidence and here the level of competence. So notice what happens when people just started acquiring some sort of knowledge about an issue. The thing is that we, the level of our confidence jumps up. It's just like we started reading a book, we read the first two chapters, and we think that we already know a lot about the subject. Turns out that as you increase your, the amount of knowledge that you actually have, you started getting more and more aware of how much you don't know, right? And if you were lucky to keep studying a subject a lot, then by the end of a long time, you may get more confident about, of about how much you know. But you're going to start telling people, trust me, it's complicated. It's not that easy. You have to learn a lot, you know, just like your teachers keep telling you all the time. OK, so let me go to a real life example. Uh, some people made experiments with lawyers and they said, OK, from now on, every case you take as a lawyer, you're going to fill in the, this form, OK? We're gonna, you're going to evaluate the case that your client has brought to you. And you're going to say, how likely I, went, I am to win this case? And they say, yeah, yeah, I think it is 70% chance. No, no, I think this is an 80% chance. And this is 90. This is 40. If, if lawyers keep doing that, what we end up seeing is that they are way too optimistic when they evaluate their chances of winning a case. And that is systematic. You can find that all over the world. Lawyers are way too optimist, optimistic when they evaluate a cause from the beginning. And that phenomenon is very, very resistant even to additional information. So check this out. These guys came back and said, look, here are the results. You lawyers, you are too optimistic in judging how likely you are to win cases. We are telling you this. Please notice that you yourself have this kind of bias. The person said, yeah, yeah, okay, now I know. And later on, they keep doing it. Even when people understand that they are susceptible to this sort of mistake, they keep making those mistakes. So this is kind of a puzzle, right? People cannot revise their own evaluation of their ability. So this is kind of a very interesting phenomenon, the Dunning-Kruger thought process. And this will have a huge impact in the service sectors of the economy. We're gonna try and give you some more examples of those later on. But for now, we're gonna stop. We have seen enough. Uh, please make notes, take notes of your doubts, of your questions, bring them to class. I will see you guys on Friday, next Friday for our, um, uh, synchronous or online uh, meeting. Okay. Thank you all. I'll see you. Bye-bye.